Hi everyone and welcome to the Ingle Nook. Thanks for joining me around the fire for some of history's greatest stories. As always, I'm your host, Logan East. Today we continue with part two of our three-part series on the infamous H.H. H. Holmes, whom some have called America's first, possibly worst, serial killer. Part one focused on recounting the story of Holmes's discovery, trial, and execution, as those events appeared to Holmes's contemporaries from 1894 to 1896. If you've not listened to it, I recommend you start there to enjoy the full story. In part two, however, we will be exploring the growth of the Holmes legend as it began while he was alive and how it developed down to our own time. H.H. Holmes is well known today by lovers of American history and true crime alike. He occupies that strange space between the gritty, detailed forensics of modern-day murder cases and the older, mythical, almost fantastic murderers of the days before modern investigative techniques, like Jack the Ripper or Lizzie Borden. Holmes, who operated in Chicago at the time of the 1893 World's Fair, has been the subject of numerous books, documentaries, podcasts, and even some video games. Most popular tellings, while including the murders of Benjamin Pitzel and three of his children, tend to concentrate on the lurid but mysterious events that took place inside Holmes' large building on the corner of 63rd and Wallace Streets in the Inglewood suburb of Chicago. The building had several storefronts on the first floor, a few apartments on the second, and a set of rooms on the third floor for disputed purposes. Most notably, the building had many odd design features such as hidden passages, compartments, and oddly placed doors. In popular legend, this building was Holmes's own personal murder factory, where he lured unsuspecting young women into his so-called World's Fair Hotel, before he murdered them in a variety of creative, sadistic ways and disposed of their bodies in a cellar furnace or sold them to be turned into demonstration skeletons. Some accounts even put his number of victims in the hundreds. Today, we will not focus on whether these accounts are true or false, though it will suffice to say that I believe they have many problems. Rather, we will, follow, we will follow how these stories emerged, spread, and grew to become the modern account of H. H. Holmes's murder castle. As mentioned in the last episode, the material for this account has come from a variety of sources, but I am most indebted to Adam Selzer and his book on H. H. Holmes, which will be linked in the description below. As always, if you enjoy what we do here at the Angle Nook and would like to support the effort, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Inglenook for just one dollar a month. I produce this show entirely on my own and appreciate any support you feel inclined to give. But without further ado, on to the story. As discussed in the previous episode, Holmes only became a suspected murderer upon investigations into his participation in insurance fraud against the Fidelity Mutual Company for faking the death of Benjamin Pitzel in 1894. Prior to that time, there had never been any serious suspicion against him as anything more than a swindler and scoundrel. As this investigation deepened and as it transformed into a murder investigation, professional investigators and curious journalists began scouring every, every place that Holmes had spent time. At first, concern emerged in Chicago over some of Holmes' past female business associates who had gone missing. Though these rumors died down, as some proved to be false during Holmes's initial fraud trial in May of 1895, they would re-emerge and explode during that summer as Holmes was formally accused of murder. While we have already studied the investigation and discovery of the Pitzel children murders, we will now begin our deep analysis of Holmes as a serial killer with the events in Chicago of the summer of 1895. When, in the middle of July, the bodies of Alice and Nellie Pitzel were discovered by Detective Frank Geyer in the basement of a Toronto rental house, attention immediately concentrated on, on Holmes as a murderer. The revelation put all of his occupations and relationships up for re-examination. This development was especially true for his operations in Chicago, where he had resided the longest, conducted the most business, and built a curious building in the rapidly growing suburb of Englewood. The building, on the corner of 63rd and Wallace Streets, would soon be dubbed by newspapers as Holmes's Castle. It was a three-story building, though the third story was a later addition and in a bad state of disrepair. That floor was unoccupied and, in some places, exposed to the elements. The first story contained a number of shops and businesses that bought or rented the space from Holmes. 
Most notable of these businesses were the drug store and jeweler shop, run in 1895 by Dr. Edward H. Robinson and C. E. Davis, respectively, though Holmes had originally run the drug store himself. There were also candy and cigar shops, and at one earlier point there had been a struggling restaurant. The second floor consisted of several apartments that had been occupied by a few tenant families. At one point, Holmes had occupied one of the units, and a number of his employees had resided there too. By the time of the investigation, most of the units were unoccupied except for the one that housed Patrick Quinlan and his family. Quinlan was the building's janitor and had been Holmes's on-and-off handyman for a few years. Holmes had kept an office in the building since the 1880s and, though he owned and operated out of a few other residences and offices in the city, most notably his second wife Murda's house in Wilmette, north of town, the Inglewood building was where most of his suspicious relationships centered. At the same time, Chicago was undergoing rapid growth and developing as the nation's second largest city. Many of the streets were now lit by gas and electric lights. Streetcars and trains glided through bustling streets and punched through clouds of fog and smoke. Overhanging much of the city, permeating the din of industry and commerce, was the stench of the sprawling Union stockyards, which connected the city's business to the rural hinterlands and provided the nation with much of its beef. The Windy City hosted the World's Columbian Exposition, or World's Fair, in 1893 that had witnessed the influx of millions of tourists and visitors, as well as a cornucopia of modern marvels. Chicago was the kind of place where a man on the mate could do anything. It was also the sort of place where someone could disappear, never to be seen again. Violence and crime of all stripes were commonplace, and, when the cause was not obvious, such as in a streetcar collision, often went unsolved. The police force was notoriously corrupt and poorly equipped to subdue the metropolis. Nevertheless, the city government was making some efforts to reform and rectify the situation so as to repair the town's rugged reputation. It was in this environment that the home story broke and the Chicago police were just as eager to make a show of investigating the celebrity case as city journalists were to publish macabre headlines. Never mind that authorities had largely left Holmes alone when he was but a serial swindler. All newspapers were busy describing Holmes as a dastard, fiend, and the king of crime. Newly appointed and ill-experienced police chief John J. Badenoch received a request from Philadelphia authorities to investigate the Holmes Castle and to dig up the basement if necessary. Badenoch obliged and appointed detectives John Norton and John Fitzgerald to assist in the task, with these two Johns often taking the lead on the ground. They began their work on July 19, 1895, and, unlike modern investigations of the kind, were followed in their every step by reporters and looky-loos from the neighborhood. They questioned Dr. Robinson, Davis, and the other building residents, and they were given an initial tour by Robinson. He showed them to the basement, which sprawled most of the length of the building, and reported a strange, unnatural stench. He showed them to a walk-in safe behind the drugstore, much discussed later, which proved to be lined with asbestos once pried open. Some would speculate on the soundproofing potential of this feature. Davis, the jeweler, showed them to Holmes's third-floor former office, which also contained a large walk-in safe and stove. Davis explained that back in August of 1893, the third floor had caught fire in the middle of the night and had never been repaired. Holmes had collected insurance money after a brief investigation. Apparently, inspectors had not searched the stove, and it was the general belief about the building that Holmes had started the fire intentionally. This was especially the view of Joe Owens, another Holmes handyman, who was upset that it had put all of the residents' lives at stake. Davis said that Patrick Quinlan had investigated the stove and, among other items, had found the pocket watch of Minnie Williams, who had been a suspected Holmes victim for some months now. Despite Holmes's claims that she was in Europe, she had never been found. It was Davis's belief that she had been murdered. Quinlan and Owens had helped Holmes and Ben Pitzel with many odd jobs, sometimes hauling heavy, mysterious trunks downstairs. 
Holmes never permitted anyone to see inside, and now Davis wondered if they had not contained human remains. He also showed inspectors the dumb waiter that went down to the cellar, which would feature in some later stories. The next day, July 20th, newspapers asserted that Minnie and Nanny Williams, who featured as side characters back in the Philadelphia investigation, had both been murdered and the remains incinerated in the upstairs stove. Furthermore, and without even the slightest evidence, they claimed that Howard Pitzel, the then still missing Pitzel child, had also been burned in the stove. This marked a chronic trend of newspapers breathlessly reporting half-baked theories that were then recycled, edited, and reinvented in other papers across the country. The process would lead to booms and busts of interest in the Holmes saga and ultimately produce some of the more fantastic portions of the Holmes mythos. Men were brought in to dig up the basement as crowds waited outside for news. The paper spoke of noxious odors and the stink of decay. After knocking down a fragile wall, they discovered a 14-foot-long fuel tank, which they began to pick at recklessly. It released gaseous fumes and, when one worker approached it with a lit candle, caused a small explosion, knocking several men down. The large tank contained an inner tank that leaked and filled the room with intolerable fumes, knocking some men unconscious. The tank had to be flooded with water and sealed back up. Neighbors recalled that, years ago, Holmes had failed had a failed glass bending business for which he made a very unique furnace in the cellar that contained inner and outer layers. He also briefly had a gas generating business that fizzled. Regardless, the whole gas tank furnace scenario would provide fodder for later speculations. Investigations into the third floor stove discovered what appeared to be bone fragments, though forensic analysis later determined the fragments to be pieces of fire clay. Nevertheless, newspapers said that the building was, quote, planned and used for the speedy and secret disposition of persons that the noted criminal elected would serve him better dead. The flats and cellars are one maze of false passages, trap doors, secluded apartments, crannies, movable panels, and myriad doorways. The building did indeed have many odd features, including a hidden stairway several hidden compartments between rooms and floors, and doors that permitted unnoticed travel around the building. But these futures were also all generally known by the inhabitants. Some former tenants spoke of Holmes being spotted in odd disguises, and how he would sometimes claim to be leaving town, only to be found tiptoeing about the castle, a name for the building that now began appearing in the papers. On July 21st, Ella Quinlan, the wife of Patrick, told reporters that she was just thankful to be alive. I think it's not short of miraculous we ain't all dead at the hands of Holmes, she remarked, somehow having a British accent. She also recalled how Holmes had convinced her husband to take out a life insurance policy on himself, a pattern that Holmes seems to have often repeated. Among other investi- excuse me, among other interesting stories that emerged at about this time, newspapers began to tell inspectors of Julia Connor and her daughter Pearl. The two had originally come to work at the building jewelry counter with Julia's husband, Ned, before Julia had left Ned to be Holmes's mistress, unbeknownst to Murda Holmes. Now they realized no one had seen Julia or Pearl since Christmas of 1891. The story of Gertie Connor, Ned's sister, also emerged at this time. Gertie, which was short for Gertrude, had come to Chicago and briefly worked as a secretary for Holmes before returning home to Iowa, where she died shortly thereafter. The Chicago Inter-Ocean, a newspaper, suggested that Holmes had seduced her, thus defaming her honor, and possibly poisoned her. Her father promptly wrote back, pointing out numerous factual errors, the most glaring one being that the paper had reported that she had died only two days upon returning home, when in fact she had died seven weeks later from a heart condition. Though the story was false, it sent a tight pattern repeated in other accounts where Holmes managed to pull off long-distance poisonings, again without very little to any evidence. By July 22nd, a constellation of plot lines was developing in the news sphere about the building. Some clothing, it is not clear what kind of clothing, was found at the bottom of a coal bin stained with what some thought might be blood. A constant point of emphasis, and some exaggeration, 
were the hidden rooms, passages, trapdoors, and stairways that some claimed would be make, would make transporting cadavers and committing wicked deeds all too easy. Soon, diagrams of the building's various floors would appear in newspapers and allow the public to play detective at home. A rope was also found in Quinlan's toolbox that had reddish stains on it, which prompted theories of Holmes hanging victims in the dumbwaiter shaft to easily transport them to the cellar. Though, as Adam Selzer points out, a two-story hanging would likely decapitate victims and be difficult to execute, never mind the total lack of any evidence for the claim. Cochineal dye, a reddish dye made from insects, was found in the basement, though only some newspapers included this tidbit in their coverage. Perhaps most significant for shedding light on likely murders, the Julia Connor story developed in two key ways. One, Julia's father shared a letter that Holmes had sent him in 1892 in which Holmes claimed to be looking for Julia regarding a lawsuit. Paired with later information, this appears to have been a cruel ruse to keep suspicion off of his own back. Papers reported that, in a closed-door Philadelphia interview, Holmes said that Julia had gotten pregnant from another man and died in a botched abortion performed by a Chicago doctor. Whether or not he actually said this, he would later claim to have performed it himself, leading to an accidental death. He claimed not to know Pearl's whereabouts. Sometimes left out of accounts of the Holmes story is that Holmes and Pitzel had built a nearly identical building at Fort Worth during early 1894 after Holmes left Chicago to flee creditors. The new castle was built on land acquired, or stolen, from Minnie Williams' estate, which held large tracts of land in the city. The building was never occupied and will be discussed more in the next episode. Though, it is worth noting that it was replete with hidden, not necessarily secret, passages and chambers, and with a mortgage listed under a witless former Holmes employee's name. About three versions of the Minnie Williams relationship were circulating at this time, which was partly encouraged by Holmes' statements in Philadelphia, and by statements acquired from newspapers, excuse me, acquired by newspapers from various witnesses. The first possibility was that Minnie was a hapless heiress who had been seduced and murdered, along with her sister Nanny, by Holmes so that he could acquire her property. The second possibility was that Minnie was just as cunning as Holmes and had worked as his partner in crime and was now in hiding, with the possibility of Nanny's murder still likely. The third possibility, put forward by Holmes, was that Minnie had been Holmes' lover and assistance in the insurance fraud scheme but had now turned against him and had her secret accomplice, Mr. Hatch, murder the Pitzel children to frame Holmes. In light of what had been discovered at the castle, Holmes' acquisition of the Fort Worth property and his blossoming reputation as a seducer and murderer of young women, the first theory was probably the most widely believed. It is also worth noting that newspapers did not all merely repeat whatever fanciful story came about. Each paper had its own approach. Some papers were much better or much worse than others. Adam Selzer offers a wonderful breakdown of these differences in his book. Some papers work to discredit others' harebrained accounts while offering theories of their own. Thus, no one but the most credulous of spectators believe all of the Holmes subplots at once. But a broad pool of possible Holmes legends was accumulating that would supply later tellings with material once the initial investigations had faded from memory. At any rate, on July 23rd, there arose a new key element in the story. It was theorized that Holmes had used the old furnace in the basement to cremate bodies rather than the smaller stove on the third floor, which would have been impractical anyway. He could have lowered corpses down the elevator shaft and thus have disposed of bodies from his apartment at an almost industrial pace. One problem for this theory, however, beyond the obvious lack of any positive evidence, is that there was no longer any such furnace in the basement. It was only known by former Holmes employees who remembered it exclusively as the strange glass-bending furnace and through the silent testimony of the old fuel tanks. But on July 24th, the first concrete evidence of possible murder was found in the castle cellar. Digging nearly three feet down, one worker located just under 20 bones in quicklime that were badly decomposed. 
they seemed to be mostly ribs, a pelvic bone, and a jaw fragment. They had been found alongside some scraps of clothing, bits of hair, bottles, and pieces of an old trunk. Dr. Robinson identified them as those of a child around age seven, and people, including Julia Connor's nephew, immediately suspected them to be the bones of Pearl. I should jump in here and say that when I first read this, it, it reminded me deeply of the finding of the bodies of Alice and Nellie, uh, though obviously in a greater state of decomposition. Based on their positioning, it looked as if the body had been dismembered before burial. Authorities did not identify the body as pearls because of popular beliefs about quicklime at the time. It was thought that quicklime acted to quickly break down bodies and thus reduce odor and lingering evidence. This myth persists today. In fact, quicklime slows the decomposition process and locks in odors. Had the bones not been limed, they might have decomposed by then, though they might have emitted a stronger stench. Nevertheless, this belief led to the idea that they were the remains of another child and not pearl, because if they had been pearls, they should have been long disintegrated, according to that theory. Another large bed of quicklime was discovered the same day, which contained what appeared to be another human bone, though accounts of this are a lot scantier. Holmes's lawyers explained the bones as having come from a prior insurance fraud scheme that fizzled. Holmes, having been a medical student, had no trouble procuring bodies, but had to dispose of them when the scheme fell apart. Holmes was a criminal and a scoundrel, but no murderer. They further claimed that the hidden passages were all for storage and speedy use by building employees, which was at least partly true. Still, this scenario acknowledged the presence of human bones in the cellar, and, when combined with the indictments for the Toronto murders of Alice and Nellie Pitzel, the murder, the murder of their father, and the still-missing Howard Pitzel, and the missing William sisters, created the impression that investigators were merely at the tip of a murderous iceberg. President Faust of Fidelity Mutual Insurance speculated that Holmes had likely killed no fewer than 20 people. Holmes's defense was further weakened some days later when the head of the city's demonstration society, responsible for securing cadavers for medical experimentation, testified that it was impossible for Holmes to have secured any legal bodies without his knowing about it. Former business associates revealed that Holmes had often hired workers to build for him, only to withhold wages, fire them, then hire new workers and repeat the process. Later, this would create the idea that no one knew the ins and outs of the building except Holmes. Though Holmes certainly did swindle workers by refusing pay, the original building was designed by and by paid architects, and employees certainly knew about the odd passages. At this time, authorities concentrated their interest on the two former janitors, Patrick Quinlan and Joe Owens. Owens had come from Ohio to offer what he knew and had much to tell, though he did mistake some facts. He had been hired by Pitzel in 1893 to clean out the basement, which was loaded with trash of all kinds. Holmes had evidently forbidden him to go into some parts of the cellar. He freely admitted being the dummy president of Holmes's copier company, which was just a shell to borrow money without repayment. He told one story of going up to Holmes's third floor office. When he knocked on the door, Holmes poked his head out, releasing extreme heat and, quote, a frightful stench. Holmes allegedly told him to leave, and Owens now suspected Holmes had been disposing of evidence in the stove. Owens also told of the third floor fire in August that he believed Holmes had started for the insurance money. Holmes apparently also asked Owens to take out a life insurance policy, which Owens prudently turned down. Throughout his interviews, Owens was calm and forthcoming. Though never under serious suspicion, he would be held in chains along with Quinlan during much of the investigation. I also want to pause here as a little intermission and just say that as I always do the research for these episodes, um, every time someone said that Holmes told them to take out a life insurance policy on themselves, I just chuckled because it, uh, it reveals something about his character, which, I don't know, to me is morbidly funny. Quinlan would have a less fortunate interrogation experience. He had never formally left Holmes' employ and was still at the castle when the investigation began. He was visibly nervous during his interrogation by Chief Badenoch and the chief's shouts could be heard by reporters in the hall. 
though they filled in many of the inaudible gaps themselves. Quinlan largely professed ignorance of any possible crimes and contradicted himself in several areas. He was provided no legal counsel and, along with his wife, was about to experience weeks of, frankly, illegal interrogation tactics. The fact was the Badenoch still had relatively little evidence to pin anything solid on Holmes beyond financial crimes, and Quinlan was his best bet at any possible murder case. By this point, the creditors, who were the real owners of the castle, Holmes had financed the entire project under false names and taken out multiple mortgages, were panicking, understandably. Inspectors judged that the two upper floors were uninhabitable from disrepair and should be condemned while the shopkeepers below were losing business. The exception was the jeweler, Davis, who soon took to offering paid tours of the building and exhibiting purported Holmes relics like an old shoe in his window. On July 25th, a new possible victim was added to the tally. The father and uncle of one Emmeline Sagrand now appeared having pieced together her connection to Holmes after seeing coverage of the case in the newspapers. Sagrand was a young, attractive blonde from Indiana who had formerly worked at the Keeley Institute, which was famed for its gold cure for alcoholism. Ben Pitzel had reportedly once stayed there in a failed attempt to cure his alcoholism and possibly connected her with Holmes. Holmes hired her on as a secretary and assistant for his phony copier company in 1892 and also briefly experimented with his own metallic patent medicine under the name of the Silver Ash Institute. Both ventures only really existed on paper to secure loans. From her family's perspective, she then suddenly got married to a man named Robert Phelps at the end of the year and left for Europe, never to be heard from again. Her relatives had tried to locate her, but they found a public announcement of her marriage in the newspapers and received wedding cards to celebrate the union. The family also received a poorly typed letter from Emmeline, which was suspicious given that she was a professional typist. It said that her new husband was a drunken loser and that she was going to Europe to start over. Her father wrote Holmes, the first letter was on Holmes's company stationery, which would have clued him into an address, and Holmes replied that he had investigated the situation out of concern for his former employee, but could find nothing. Now, Emmeline's family believed that Emmeline and Robert Phelps had been murdered by Holmes. Neighborhood gossip, however, revealed that Mr. Phelps might never have existed, and that Emmeline might, may have had an affair with Holmes, gotten pregnant by accident, and disappeared much as Julia Connor did almost exactly one year before. One Mrs. Lawrence, who had once lived in the building with her husband, was a key source on both Sagrand and Connor. She recounted that, while Holmes and Sagrand had had a close, even improper relationship, it cooled suddenly in the winter of 1892, right before her disappearance. Sagrand even remarked that Holmes could get along without her if necessary. Quote, I have not the slightest doubt that Holmes killed Miss Sagrand, Lawrence affirmed. She also recounted that, the day after Sagrand disappeared, Holmes and Quinlan, with the help of two other men living in the building, had hauled a heavy, mysterious trunk from Holmes' office to be shipped away. Holmes had apparently been nervous and warned the men to be careful. He disappeared to Wilmette for a few days and later returned with the wedding cards seemingly out of the blue. On the same day the Sagrand story was exploding, Ned Connor, Julia Connor's ex-husband, arrived for a lengthy interview that was widely printed in the city's newspapers. He had come to work as a jeweler in the castle in 1889 with Julia and their daughter Pearl. He described his unfortunate years working there, how Holmes had convinced him to buy the failing jeweler's shop while simultaneously seducing Julia away from him. He described Holmes' numerous business schemes in detail, most especially the glass-bending business. He claimed that the cellar fuel tanks really were meant for glass bending and that Holmes had actually built three successively larger furnaces and as each proved insufficient for the task. He had seen Holmes experimenting and ruining large amounts of plate glass before he finally gave up. Ned also described how Holmes had pestered him about whether or not he knew where Julia was in 1892 after her late 1891 disappearance. Ned, after pretending that he did know to get a rise out of Holmes, finally admitted that he did not, upon which Holmes settled down and left him alone.
Ned in a comical story also related how Holmes had nagged him about getting life insurance policy for a mere one dollar premium. Ned had offered him a dollar if he needed it so badly, but finally agreed just to silence Holmes. Upon receiving the paperwork, however, he wrote Holmes' name down instead. Ned, it seemed, maintained quite the sense of humor in the face of the man who had taken so much from him. As a final note, Ned expressed common knowledge of the trapdoor and secret passages as convenient ways of moving things around. The few words he offered on Ben Pitzel and Pat Quinlan suggested that they might have been impressionable home stooges along for some illegal financial gains, not real hardened criminals. I just want to comment again that it's funny as you go through the sources on the Holmes material because many newspaper articles will read, you know, this dark, horrific story where people are getting killed left and right. And then you hear Ned's testimony and Holmes comes off as this almost pathetic figure who's desperately trying to get insurance scams and uh, breaking plate glass in his basement. And I don't know, it's this is very bipolar characterization. But back to the back to the story. Meanwhile, Pat and Ella Quinlan were being detained separately in what was called the sweat box, with minimal accommodations and no intercommunication, despite not being charged with a crime. Police had apparently invented a story of Pat having had an affair and secret child to turn Ella against him, though the ploy seems not to have worked. When shown her husband chained to Joe Owens, however, Ella broke down and confessed to knowing about the fire insurance scheme, but nothing else. The couple was then separated again. At the same time, a bench covered in odd stains and what appeared to be knife marks was discovered. While the stains looked like blood, it could not be determined if it was human or animal. Later theorists would suggest that Holmes had used the bench to dismember and dissect his victims. Toward the end of July, the Holmes investigation in Chicago entered a new phase that would go a long way toward building up the Holmes legend we know today. New concrete discoveries largely ceased, and a few new and few new clues of value would be found in the castle. The news cycle of the day, famous now under the name yellow journalism, as we so often say in history class, often concentrated on ill-sourced sensational stories to sell copies. While one might argue that today's news cycle is not as different as we'd like to imagine, Newspapers at the time pr produced an avalanche of Holmes stories to fill in the many gaps and to expand upon the various theories begun with the initial investigation. Soon, stories would be based upon reports of reports, where old articles stood in as the underlying sources for new articles since no additional of substantial evidence was available. Newspapers now recorded numerous testimonies from one-time Holmes associates who claimed all sorts of suspicious encounters. Commonly, people asserted that Holmes had given them strange medicines, or that people had suddenly fallen ill in his presence. One creditor and former owner of the castle, John de Bruyle, whose name I struggle to pronounce, had collapsed and fallen dead outside of the building on his way to talk with Holmes. Though the event had been interpreted as heart failure at the time, it was now recast in a shadier lens. One person claimed that Holmes had asked him if a body could be burned at a stove. <laughs> Which, if that story is true, I imagine this sort of deranged Holmes saying, Hey, do you think a body could be burned in a stove? But, um, who knows. Another man that worked on the building in 1889 claimed that Holmes had offered him money to drop a brick on his alleged brother-in-law. Even Murda Holmes's great-uncle, Jonathan Belknap, claimed that Holmes had either tried to push him off the building's roof or to kill him in his sleep. Jonathan's uh, stories changed a lot, however. A constant challenge in determining what Holmes was really like is the popular process of reinterpretation or reimagination in hindsight. Though Holmes had never been suspected of murder until 1894, people in every town he had ever visited, and some that he had not, now spoke of his dreadful presence, evil eye, and near-miss murder stories. This is a common enough phenomenon even today. No one wants to have been schoolyard pals with Ted Bundy, after all, and others are simply eager to insert themselves into deadly events as lucky survivors. To be fair, however, Holmes did not help his own case. Though few material facts had changed since the discovery of the Pitzel girls' bodies, he constantly changed his stories and thus cast doubt on almost every deed of his life. 
At this point in late July, the police jumped into the speculation game. Assistant Police Chief Ross put forward a theory that Emmeline Segrand had been lured into the third floor vault and suffocated. A reporter built on the story, imagining Holmes dragging the body out in the dead of night and cutting it apart on the dissection bench before burying it in the cellar. Later stories would imagine Holmes piping gas into the vault, and investigators and bystanders soon imagined seeing a woman's bare footprint on the interior vault door, though no one could agree where it was, whether it was one or multiple prints, or if it was even there. While there was no real underlying evidence for this almost cartoonish murder, the third floor vault was not even installed before Emmeline's disappearance, it had stuck around as one of the more memorable Holmes stories. As his legends grew about Holmes' apparent ability to pipe gas into various rooms in the castle, the building's cigar merchant would explain that, while the lights had gas and electric fixtures, no gas pipe connection was ever made, and gas never flowed in the building. Despite this information, the idea remains part of the Holmes lore today. It's also, uh, if you've ever seen those light fixtures, maybe if you're into antiques or something, that have both the gas and the electric fixtures, or this really cool... Uh, relic of this transitional time, but it also reminds us that Holmes's building had electric lights, which may not be something you associate with the 1890s. Some investigators were even trying to tie Holmes to other unsolved violent murders in Chicago. Cooler heads, however, noted that there was really nothing to tie Holmes to cases as the murder of one Mrs. Cron, who had been brutally stabbed to death in her own home. Though much abused by reporters, Murda, Holmes's Chicago wife, asserted that Holmes in his family life was extremely kind and considerate. She remarked that he had never raised his voice and that he was especially fond of children. Murda confessed that he was likely guilty of many financial crimes, but expected that the wave of murderous tales would only prove that all accusations of murder were mere products of the professional rumor mill. Amid this speculative barrage came the bombshell story of Myron G. Chapel, whose name is often misspelled in sources, Chapel arrived at the police station claiming to be a skeleton articulator who had unwittingly worked with Holmes in the past. Furthermore, he claimed that Pat Quinlan had been Holmes' chief assistant in disposing of bodies, which was music to Chief Badenoch's ears. The outline of his story was that Holmes had approached him in 1892 with the offer of work for stripping and articulating skeletons. Holmes had apparently shown Chapel a male body in the castle that had most of its upper body flesh removed already. Chapel did the job, and satisfied, Holmes presented him with a female body. This one he described as, quote, a jackrabbit which had been skinned by splitting the skin down the face and rolling it back off the entire body. Chapel did the job, and then did the same to another body in 1893. He said that he gave the first and third skeletons to Holmes for cash, but kept the second, which he claimed to have at home in a trunk. He believed that this body to he believed this body to be that of Julia Connor, though it would have been presented to him almost a year after her disappearance. Curiously, he said that the skull had been hanging that the skull had been hanging on a tree in his yard since then. Meanwhile, the mother of one Emily Van Tassel, a 17-year-old girl who had disappeared in June 1892, entered the fray. She previously believed that Emily had been killed by a paid assassin, but now she claimed that Holmes had been the murderer, though she could not identify him when presented with photographs. It was even suggested by the Williams family attorney that many a nanny Williams' brother, Baldwin, had been somehow murdered by Holmes possibly with the blackmailed help of Ben Pitzel. Baldwin had been injured in a smeltery accident where he worked in Denver, Colorado. He had eventually succumbed to his wounds while Holmes was far away in Chicago. Nevertheless, Holmes did collect his life insurance payout in Minnie's name after Minnie had disappeared. I, I do like the idea, or I don't know if I like it, it's, it's funny that uh, the theory that a 17-year-old girl was killed by a paid assassin... Uh, I, I do suspect that maybe the mother of Emily Van Tassel was perhaps mentally unwell. Um, at, at any rate, the home story was reaching peak momentum, and a crowd of about 5,000 people now gathered around the castle, trying to gain access and investigate it for themselves. It was at this point that Davis, the jeweler, tried to offer paid tours before being stopped by Chief Badenoch. 
Chapel, the articulator, seemed to be the police's best chance at proving murder in Chicago. They had retrieved the half-skeleton from his house that he had spoken of, and then Chapel showed them around the castle to locations where he said Holmes had shown him to the bodies. He claimed that the bodies had been lowered down the elevator shaft after being suffocated in the vault, and that various body parts had been there previously. It is important to note that such theories were, by this point, all circulating in the city's newspapers and were well known to the public. The Chapel story encountered its first hurdles, however, when the reporter spoke to Chapel's son, Charles Chapel. Charles said that, while his father had had some limited business with Holmes, it did not involve articulating skeletons. Furthermore, while his father had done some skeleton work for local medical students years ago, it was not his regular business, and the aforementioned skull was from the prior work. He also claimed that his father was a drunkard, slightly insane, and could tell wild stories once he'd had a few drinks. More bad news for the police came when reporters spoke to Chapel's wife. She corroborated what her son had said, emphasizing his drinking habits and tall tales. She explained that the skull in the tree, which was painted red, had been in the house for eight or nine years, from when Chapel had articulated a few skeletons for the medical school. Only lately had he hung it in the tree, and a neighbor had reported it to the police as possibly being related to Holmes. I want to add here that it's just a very bizarre scene that he would hang a painted red skull in his tree. Um, very interesting. When police first questioned Chapel, he denied any involvement, but later decided to go and testify to police. On his way, he was met by police officers who plied him with drinks and got him to tell a story of working for Holmes. Mrs. Chapel further claimed that the half-skeleton found at the home had been planted by police while the red skull was confirmed by neighbors to have been in the house for eight or nine years. Furthermore, when Chapel has, was taken to the medical college, no one remembered him or his alleged work for them. As a final effort to prove his story, the police dug for acid tanks that Chapel claimed to have seen when Holmes had hired him. Workers found more bones as they dug, though most of these proved to be animal bones. Only one tank was located, and it contained more gaseous oil that Ned Connor explained was for the glass-bending furnace. With this failure, the Chapel story fizzled until being revived in later years. More claims of possible victims continued to appear in papers, as they had when Holmes was first accused of murder. But as more of those supposed victims appeared alive and well, were found to be clearly unrelated, and as the Chapel case flopped, police appeared to have a clown car scenario on their hands that frustrated attempts to find out more about the smaller group of probable Holmes victims, like the Williams sisters, Emmeline Segrand, and Julia and Pearl Connor. This carnival of accusations also spawned a small but vocal group of Holmes defenders who would maintain a belief in his innocence and work to locate the dastardly Mr. Hatch and Minnie Williams. I chuckle because I really don't think that a Mr. Hatch ever existed. By July 30th and 31st, the Chicago Press, itself one of the greatest producers of false Holmes allegations, had now turned largely against the Chicago police and the host of Holmes accusers. One headline literally read, Laughing at the Police. Holmes's lawyers at this point joked that bones from Timbuktu or the Sandwich Islands would soon be supplied as evidence against Holmes. While some stories about Holmes paying to ship bodies or setting up dubious insurance policies continued to trickle in, momentum was oddly moving in Holmes's favor. Accordingly, Police Chief Badenoch was feeling pressure to conclude the investigation and move on to more promising publicity prospects. Holmes, at any rate, was facing difficult murder charges in Philadelphia and Toronto and might never make it to a hypothetical trial in Chicago. The police would have little to gain from proving his crimes at this point and much to lose if their leads continued to blow up in their faces. For what it was worth, on July 31st, Holmes explained to reporters his relationship with Emmeline Segrand, though much of the statement was clearly false. For what it was worth, on July 31st, Holmes explained to reporters his relationship with Emmeline Segrand, though much of the statement was clearly false. He claimed to have met and hired Emmeline as a typist because she was talented and attractive. At least he was honest on that score. The two began an affair after taking a boat trip across Lake Michigan together. 
which seems plausible enough. Holmes seemed to have a habit of taking women like the Williams sisters on such boat rides to spend time in western Michigan, which would have been close to his old stomping ground in medical school, which we will talk about later on in episode 3. He claimed that the two kept up an affair in the castle and for some time until she allegedly confessed her relationship to a priest. The priest visited Holmes and told him to marry her. To please her, he set up a phony wedding in rural Minnesota until the relationship was accidentally discovered by Pat Quinlan, whereupon he sent her to a convent in the summer of 1892. The timeline is clearly wrong. Emmeline disappeared from the castle in December of 1892, and the story does not account for any of the events surrounding Emmeline's purported marriage to Robert Phelps. By now, it was determined that a photo on Holmes's person at the time of his arrest was that of Emmeline Segrand, and the interviewer asked him why he had had it. To this he replied that, quote, Emily was an extremely pretty girl, and I have been a noted connoisseur in pretty pictures. The truth, unfortunately, was that Emmeline was almost certainly dead. My own belief is that she was killed in a clandestine abortion likely performed by Holmes himself, much like the case of Julia Connor one year earlier. Holmes's last confession before his execution hints at this possibility but we shall discuss which murders Holmes likely committed next episode. August marked a turning point in the Holmes story and its formulation into the World's Fair serial killer story we know today. While a few interesting stories continued to come in, including one possible holmes Pitzel murder in Mississippi, the Chicago portion of the investigation was winding down. Badenoch was ready to move on, and the Quinlans were finally released without any serious charges. They would wage a few semi-successful legal battles against the police for mistreatment over the next couple of years, though most newspapers would never apologize for the rumors they had spread about the couple as accessories to mass murder. No more significant evidence at the castle was ever found. Soon it would be remodeled, and all traces of Holmes's time there would be forgotten before its destruction in the 1930s. Newspapers, however, were not done in molding the Holmes story, especially those outside of Chicago that largely ignored stories that discredited any Holmes allegations. On August 1st, the Philadelphia Press, which was a newspaper, published an anonymous story that set the story in a new light. I will tell you candidly, it said, that Holmes has murdered more people than the nine we have evidence of having met death at his hands. If you can make out a list of persons who disappeared in Chicago during the World's Fair and who had money in their possession... I will stake my reputation that a majority of them will be traced to the Holmes Castle in 63rd Street, and that their existence abruptly ended there. While the story did not yet refer to the now infamous World's Fair Hotel, it laid out the notion that Holmes effectively used the castle to lure in unsuspecting tourists before murdering them for money or other reasons. On August 11th, the New York World published one of the most consequential articles in the Holmes saga. The World was Joseph Pulitzer's flagship paper and one of the most widely read in the country at the time. Though it ran a number of high-quality, hard-hitting columns, it also pumped out a torrent of tabloid sensationalism. Today, it is notorious as one of the papers, along with William Randolph Hearst's newspapers, that pushed America into the Spanish-American War just two years after Holmes' execution. Adam Selzer identifies the article entitled Castle of a Modern Bluebeard, from the mythical French wife killer, as one of two or three key sources for all modern home stories. The article was complete with illustrations and a diagram of the castle's second floor. New, however, were the ghoulish names assigned to the castle's odd rooms, like the Hanging Secret Chamber, the Room of the Three Corpses, the Death Shaft, and the Black Closet. The article, which had no original sourcing, was an amalgamation of every home story that had come out of Chicago, plus some extra speculation to add effect. The article, which called the building a veritable murder factory, claimed that Holmes was charged with 11 murders and suspected of many more. It spoke, which also I should add, that's, that's just false, he was not charged with those murders, it spoke of a basement crematorium and hundreds of rooms where victims could be removed with more expedition and safety than in the mountain stronghold of any feudal baron and which none but Holmes has ever known the secret. 
The long piece provided many imagined descriptions of rooms and purported murders. But most importantly, it expanded the concept of the castle as a deadly World's Fair attraction. It claimed that the castle was built immediately preceding the opening of the World's Fair, with the purpose of luring unsuspecting tourists to the supposed hotel with misleading advertisements. For the first time, it implied the possibility that hundreds of people might have met their end in the building, being disposed of in his quicklime vats, in his mysterious oil tank with its death-dealing liquids, or burned in the furnace. This basic version of the story is the one most people today encounter of Holmes, though it would be largely forgotten for several decades. We will explore what really happened in the castle in the next episode, but for now we will follow this story's journey into the 20th century. The next week, the Chicago Tribune reprinted the Bluebeard article and someone set fire to the castle, ruining what remained of the second and third stories. The conflagration prompted renewed interest and large portions of the Bluebeard piece were copied by the Chicago papers, thus cementing the fanciful account while destroying much of the original building. The top two floors would be remodeled by the largest mortgage holders and stand for decades to come. At any rate, the event marked the effective end of the contemporary investigations into Holmes's Chicago career, while most attention would focus on the ongoing Pitzel murder trial, Holmes's wild confessions, and his ultimate execution. At this point in the story, we fast forward to the development of the Holmes legend in the years following his execution, which was detailed in the last episode. After his execution, plenty of events would bury Holmes's story deep in the past, as happens to most murder stories, especially in an age before Americans became obsessed with true crime and serial killers. Still, for years after his execution, people would speak of a Holmes curse or his evil eye. Anytime someone related to the story suddenly died, much the way people spoke of the curse of King Tut in the years following the unearthing of Tutankhamun's tomb by Howard Carter in 1922. One of the men Holmes confessed to murdering in his famous written confession, Henry Rogers, was still alive when Holmes confessed, but succumbed only three months later to cancer. In October of 1896, should add only one year before the very famous election of that year, Superintendent Perkins of Moimensing Prison, where Holmes had been executed, walked into his office, sat down, and blew his brains out. The poor man had been suffering from insomnia. Police Chief John Badenoch was fired in the midst of his lawsuit with the Quinlans. In November of 1897, a fire destroyed much of the Fidelity Mutual Company's office in Philadelphia, though the original Holmes arrest warrant, which had been framed, survived the blaze unharmed. Father McPake, who had been one of the two attending priests to Holmes's execution, was found dead under mysterious circumstances in December of 1897. In 1909, two masked bandits robbed a saloon in Chicago. As they fled, one was shot in the head and killed. It was discovered afterward that the fugitive was none other than Marion Hedgepeth, the train robber who had first snitched on Holmes for his role in killing Pitzel. Finally, in 1912, Richard Johnson, a funny name, um, one of the jurors who convicted Holmes killed himself by inhaling natural gas. Sorry for the chuckle there, that's not funny. Um, more than likely, these are all simply unfortunate coincidences having nothing to do with Holmes, except perhaps the firing of Badnock. Most people involved in the case went on to live normal lives, often not being associated with Holmes at all. Detective John Norton went on to play a significant role in bringing Al Capone to justice. District Attorney George Graham, Holmes's main prosecutor, went on to serve in Congress. Samuel Roden, Holmes's best defense lawyer, went on to be a successful Republican politician. Even Jep the Howe, the corrupt St. Louis lawyer that aided Holmes in his insurance scam, went on to be a player in Missouri politics. C.E. Davis, the jeweler, went on to open a successful jewelry shop in Montana, where he died in 1948. Dr. Edward Robinson, though he moved shop, continued to practice medicine and died in Inglewood in 1952. And, as Selzer notes, uh, no one bothered to interview him even when Holmes became famous again. Most surprising of all, his three wives, Clara Lovering, Myrta Holmes, she kept the name until her death, and Georgiana Yoke all went on to live relatively successful lives. 
Murda went on to be a teacher and, later, the principal of over 30 small schools. Clara, the first person to be wronged by Holmes, remained or remarried in 1906 and lived to the age of 95. Georgiana remarried and died in Los Angeles in 1945. Robert and Lucy, Holmes's only known children, went on to live, healthy, live to healthy ages in Florida and California, respectively. There appears to have been almost no discussion of the Holmes case by the 1910s, and the legend did not resurface during Chicago's Second World's Fair in 1933. That finally changed in 1937, when the Chicago Tribune published a lengthy article entitled Murder Castle! The story focused on random portions of the Holmes story that had little to do with the actual castle. Its most interesting contribution is its description of the castle as it then stood as a dated, nearly five decades old building. The building was bought and demolished by the federal government to to make way for a new post office the next year, though the post office does not occupy the exact spot where the old building stood. By then, Holmes was merely an Inglewood urban legend. That all changed in 1940 with the publication of Herbert Asbury's Gem of the Prairie. Which was, wi- which was a widely read collection of old Chicago crime stories that included a chapter on Holmes. According to Selzer's excellent historiography, most modern accounts and retellings simply take Asbury's account at face value or copy his material wholesale. Asbury was a popular writer whose sourcing was lazy and which took liberties in the name of entertainment. His account is built around the New York World's Bluebeard article and describes the castle as a murder factory hotel built to take advantage of the Chicago World's Fair. He estimated Holmes' victim count to lie between 30 and several hundred. In addition to repeating all of the old Holmes stories, he invented some new ones. One of the most famous and long-lasting is that of the poor old Dr. Holton. The story was that when Holmes first arrived in Chicago, he acquired his first drugstore across from the eventual location of the castle by working for the elderly owners. Old Dr. Holton was bedridden, and his old wife was overwhelmed by the work. The charming Holmes offered to take over, and the old couple disappeared, never to be seen again. While a Dr. Holton did exist, and did sell Holmes a drugstore, we will see next week how completely fabricated Asbury's account was. He also invented a story about Holmes possessing several strange torture machines in his basement. One was supposed to be a stretching machine intended to, quote, produce a race of giants. It effectively combined the Bluebeard article, The Holmes Confession, and incorporated new sensational elements to produce the foundation of the modern Holmes legend. Ironically, the Pitzel murder case, which was the most publicized part of the Holmes story in his lifetime, and his only proven crime, took a back seat to the fantastic tales surrounding the World's Fair Hotel and America's apparent first serial killer. Later accounts of the Holmes story would often take the form of historical novels that added much in the form of good storytelling, but little new information or critical analysis. When the term serial killer caught on in the 1980s and 90s, Holmes fit into the mold without much serious questioning. And, if his death tally really did stretch into the hundreds, he was surely one of the most prolific to boot. In 2003, however, Holmes' story was thrown back into the public consciousness with Eric Larson's book, The Devil in the White City, which told the dual stories of the planning and construction of the 1893 World's Fair alongside the murderous career of H.H. H. Holmes. The book is a fantastic story. It is one of the most enjoyable pieces of popular history I have read, and it was this And it was in this era that I first recall as a child hearing the Holmes story in a TV documentary. Later, it was the first full book I read on the subject, and I took most of it at face value. But the story Larson tells and the sources he relies on fall squarely in the realm of the New York World article, Holmes' deeply unreliable confession and Asbury-style accounts. Today, it is easily the most famous account of Holmes as a mass-murdering serial killer, and has spawned numerous derivative presentations, ranging from documentaries, blogs, podcasts, and games. I want to reemphasize here that, uh, and Selzer does in his book too, and I fully agree with him, um, it's not a criticism of the style of that book, The Devil in the White City, um, which is a very 
enjoyable book. It, it is just observing that factually the Holmes portions largely rely on the myth of Holmes, not the underlying reality. Um, next week, however, we shall discover the real life and deeds of H.H. H. Holmes with the help of the most recent scholarship on the topic. I believe that, like me, you will find the real story of crime, murder, and lies even more interesting than the over-the-top versions heard today. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Angle Nook, be sure to like, favorite, or leave a review. If you'd like to support the work I'm doing here, you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Nook for only $1 a month, linked in the description below. With time, I hope to provide patrons with extra episodes, show notes, and more. For now, thanks for stopping by. I hope to have you around again real soon.